Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you um, about the wonderful world of spiders. Obviously, spiders can be very alarming, very confronting animals. Um, but some of the ways they interact with the world, and in particular some of the ways they solve problems that they face in the world, uh, I think are, are fascinating and, and certainly worthy of attention. Um, and as we've just heard, I do have with me one of the main spiders that we study. Um, this is a spider called uh, Nephila, um, and it's also um, known as the golden orb weaving spider. And so she's just going to join me um, up here, and I'm going to let her be part of the show. So I'll just put her here nicely, and um, she will help us communicate today the beauty uh, of some of these animals. And I'm just going to turn this microphone here so you can see. And if she gets uh, excited or nervous, you can tell me like a pantomime. <gasps> she's behind me, she's in front of me, but she should be. Well, maybe not in my mouth wouldn't be ideal. Okay, um, and so before we get too, too, too started here, I don't want her to fall, that's another issue. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about some of the stuff we do in the lab primarily. Um, and so we're interested, as, as we've heard, in animal behavior, and a lot of the work we do is underwater. Um, and so here's one of our field sites, this is um, Corsica, and so a lot of the work you might see if you look at any of our research papers are, are, are studies that are done underwater. Um, and in those places, we're very interested in using um, machine learning, artificial intelligence and tracking, AI approaches to, to behavior, where we try to analyze and understand the behavior of many different animals using computational approaches that help us do so um, when we're limited by our own abilities as humans um, to sense and, and track and, and understand the behavior of many animals as they interact at once. And so it's these sort of computational approaches to behavior um, that are helping us overcome our own limitations. Um, we're interested in using these kind of tracking approaches where we're breaking down the behavior of these animals, um, but also the ornamentation and the color. Um, so here we're looking at, at, at guppies. Um, and we're also interested in topics, for instance, like self-consciousness. Um, uh, we're, we're continuing to work on this idea of, of whether animals are self-conscious and self-aware. Things like the mirror test, where the animals can recognize their own reflection in the mirror. And, and using, again, some of these computational approaches to analyzing attributes and elements of the behavior that we can't see with our own eyes, that we need these advanced techniques in order to help us uh, visualize and understand some of these things. We're not just interested in animals, we're interested in the whole of, 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 of the natural world. And so we're also interested in something called plant behavior. This might come as a surprise to you, but the time frame may be different um, in terms of how quickly plants behave, but they are behaving. They're socially interacting, they're avoiding one another, they're avoiding shade, all of these kind of things. And so this is the broad scope that we're interested in um, of, of how things interact and how things uh, move in the world, and in particular also how they sense the world around them. And it may also come as a surprise, but perhaps you'll see, hopefully, this uh, uh, session that, um, that, that plants are sensing the world and interacting with the world. We're interested also in, in understanding how different species and different animals interact with the world we create. And so this concept of interspecies architecture. We're interested in architectural designs and practices that may be compassionate and sympathetic to the desires and, and aesthetic uh, preferences of non-human species. And so one of my students is here, Anya. She's actually running the, the Spider Sense uh, exhibition in the other building. She's been working with artists and architects to build some of these structures that humans Humans may design based on their own preferences and then place those underwater and ask then how fish and, and non-human animals in marine environments also use those same structures. Do they share the same aesthetic and architectural principles that we share if we were to build buildings in coastal regions that we know will soon be underwater? Can we build them in ways that we will then be able to bequeath them to the new owners uh, when sea level rise happens in 50 years or so? And we're also interested in the interface between art and science, very, very interested in this. Um, and so a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking to you about today is, um, is 
manifested in many artistic uh, exhibitions around the world. And here's one we currently have um, with, a, with a friend of mine, uh, Thomas Saraceno, at the Shed in New York City, where some of the data and, and information we get from, from our spider work is directly um, built into to some uh, interactive exhibitions. And you're going to get a little taste of that um, if you go down to the Spider Sense um, installation in the other building. Okay, so that's our preamble, and you've met our nice friend, um, and I'll get her out again uh, if, if you desire. Um, but let's talk about spiders, and in particular the way spiders sense the world and some of the awesome attributes that they have for the specific use cases they need to apply and some of the specific problems uh, that they face and need to solve. And we're going to focus on orb-weaving spiders, just like this Nephila. In fact, this is another species of Nephila. Um, and the reason we do that is because they have a very, very different way that they need to interact with the world. Of course, by definition, they build these webs. Um, and as you're probably very familiar with, orb-weaving spiders, outside of the times when they're building the web, are very sedentary. They're what we call sit-and-wait predators. They sit on the web and it looks like they're doing nothing. But in fact, that whole time they're doing a lot of things. They're integrating a lot of sensory information and they're feeling the world. In fact, this, um, this orb, this web that they build has been proposed as a form of extended cognition. It's a way that they build something out in the world that is very much like our fingers and our eyes. It's a sense organ that they build and tells them something about the world and that they can change. And the other thing about orb-weaving spiders, um, and I'm sorry for the arachnophobes in the audience, <laughs> but there's some very, very wonderful things. Now, as you've seen, I, I work with very large spiders. That's definitely to scare and confuse journalists, absolutely. Um, but one of the other attributes is they're very easy to work with. They're, they're, they're robust, they're easy to, to, to study, to handle, to move around. Um, and here's just another uh, uh, Nephila. This is Pilipes, one of the largest uh, spiders in the world, as you can see by the size of this animal. But the other thing I want you to notice, if you can, and I'll see if I can, if you can see my laser pointer here, in these numbers, you are seeing the location of the eyes on these animals. And I want you to just notice that compared to the very large chelicerae here, the very large fangs, the eyes, even though there are eight of them, are very small. Um, and this is because the orb weavers effectively do not see anything. Their eyes have become very reduced over the course of evolution because that's not how they interact with the world. And so just because they have eight eyes, you shouldn't uh, assume that these spiders can see. That is not the primary sense organ that they use. In fact, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, I also study in my lab jumping spiders, or rather some of the members of my lab study jumping spiders, and they are very visual, right? These are very, very uh, visually capable animals. But orb-weaving spiders are not. They effectively do not see any shapes. They do not form any images. It seems that they use their eyes primarily to detect large objects moving past them or around them. And that's the only real way they use this sense, and it's the only real reason that they've kept this sense um, in an evolutionary sense. But rather, um, they're using uh, this, this very uh, delicate uh, interaction with the web and this very um, sensitive and, and sophisticated form of, um, of seismic sensing. They are feeling the world. They are truly, in a tactile sense, feeling the world. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about orb-weaving spiders is that they have this wonderful um, difference in males and females. And this is called sexual dimorphism. Sexual obviously referring to the two sexes in this case. Dimorphism meaning two shapes, two morphs. And the, um, this orb-weaving spider of this genus, Nephila, um, has one of the greatest differences in which the female can be 100 times larger than the male. The male is effectively a mobile um, reproductive unit that goes out in the world and looks for females to mate with, and then he will typically die in that process. And so he has one purpose. This is, this is, this is really pure. It's a really noble cause. These males are not designed to do anything. They can't feed. They can't build webs. Um, they can't do anything much except find a female and hope for the best. And here you're seeing 
um, I don't know if you can notice, but these legs are the legs, the front legs of the female. And here is the male trying to approach her very, very carefully and gingerly, not to make too much noise on the web. And here's another concept, noise on the web. Not, not too much of a seismic input into the web that the female would notice and potentially eat him. And you may think, well, well why would the female want to eat him? Um, and that's also a very interesting evolution evolutionary story, and here is a, a, a spider. I keep these spiders in my office. I quite like them. Um, and this one is in my office, and she has a female. Uh, sorry, the female has a male, and you may have noticed that, that interaction came to a rather violent end, sort of Shakespearean in that sense. Um, if we just go back, so here is the male. And this male takes up a position on the female. This is a successful male. He's done the right thing. He's been able to approach her without being eaten. Um, and he's taken up a, a mating position. And he mates with her in that location until she's had enough. And this female has had enough. And it ends by her, she feels him. See? She's feeling him. She's listening. She knows he's there. And then, bang. And this guy got away. He dropped down, but you'll notice that she's got a few of his legs in her mouth. So they both gained from this interaction, you know, it was a win-win situation. But typically males do not escape this, this mating encounter. Typically males are killed in this encounter, um, but they've fulfilled the only purpose that they had, which was to mate. And so, you know, in the broad scheme of things, everyone's happy. Now, part of my research is to try to understand how a very, very small animal like this, which cannot see, which has nothing that we would formally recognize as a brain, it does have a centralized collection of, of neurons, but it doesn't have the, the broad structure that we probably would think colloquially as a brain. And it can only move around the world and feel where it is. It's trying to find something that is literally the most dangerous thing it could possibly attempt to approach um, and, and mate with this female. And it lives in these worlds. This is a picture that I take, took in one of our field sites in Australia where there are thousands and thousands of these very large female spiders building webs that are all interconnected. So you have this incredibly complex interconnected world in which these males, which really can't problem solve, have to solve what is a very, very difficult and dangerous problem. And this is a purpose of our research. How do they use the senses that they have to solve such a complex task? And, and indeed, can they solve such a complex task? Um, and just to give you a little bit of natural history, so as I've said, the females build this web, they build a very large web, the males will move around and settle on the female's webs. They can't approach her directly because she'll kill them, but they move around and they wait on this web and they form these hierarchies. And so you see here there's different males on the web and the distance you are from the female determines the order in which you will mate with that female. Um, and that's because it's only safe to approach her when she's caught something else to eat, whether that's a, a, spy, a, 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 sorry, a fly or a beetle or indeed another male, then all the males will rush in and they'll attempt to mate with her. And so what males do is go around, see, they're not so bad, no? You're getting, you're warming up. Um, what, these, what these males will do is move around in this very complex world and they'll choose which web is the best option for me. Okay, this web is great, it has a female on it, but she's small, so she doesn't have so many eggs. But this web has a big female on it. Ah, but it's also got three or four other males with whom I have to compete. And I have no brain. I also don't have any eyes. I don't really have any ears. So how am I gonna possibly solve this problem? And this is part of our research program. If you're interested in some of the details, they're presented in quite a few papers we have. I'm not going to go into those today. Happy to talk to you throughout the festival about the details of the science. But just to, to tell you that it's even worse than I just presented to you, because there might be a world in which there's one female that's very large, has a lot of eggs, and that's your preference represented here. But the moment you make that decision, the whole world changes by virtue of your decision. And this is something we call um, an optimal foraging problem or an ideal free distribution problem or a Nash equilibrium, where you're trying to come up with the best solution to a task 
but everybody else is also trying to come up with that solution. And here the question is, can this little spider do anything that even remotely approaches such a solution? Um, and so here, um, we're just getting another visual of the web itself. Um, and, and I just want to point out the limited capacity that these males and females have to interact with the world, which is entirely concentrated in these organs that detect vibration and seismic information. And so when a male enters this web, he has to feel that web. He has to feel whether there's a female on the web. He has to feel whether there are other males on the web using these particular sense organs. And so with this in mind, um, some students in my lab, this is Amir and Silvia, um, went to Panama. We work a lot in the rainforest where these, these animals are from. We try to do all our work in the wild as well, as much as we can, because of course that's where uh, these animals live and have evolved. And so we try to take all that tech all that technology that I mentioned in the start of the talk with the tracking and all of these um, quantitative approaches to those places. And so this is work that I'm going to, the, the work that I'm going to talk about is from, from Amir and Sylvia. Um, and we wanted to test this idea that I had when I was looking at these interactions that maybe the simplest possible solution is the one these animals are using. They can only feel the world, they can feel attraction to a female, repulsion to other males, repulsion to the females. It's very much like the structure of an atom in which you have electrons that are both attracted to the nucleus but also repelled by other electrons. And if you have a complete um, shell of electrons around this nucleus, there's no way you can enter this system. And the web itself just sort of conceptually made me think, wow, that's, that's potentially a really good analogy for what's happening. Can we apply that analogy uh, in this sort of seismic world of spiders and see how well that holds up? And the reason that it looked like it did, just at, at a first glance, is that when we look at the tracks, the way these males move around the female, we see this gap. They, they circle around her in this orbit, but they never approach too quickly. And in fact, the only one in this data set that did was killed immediately. When we analyze this sort of more uh, formally, we find that males occupy these energy states. Effectively, they occupy different valence shells around the female. So they're clearly attracting and repelling one another at the same time. And when we went all the way into this, it gets very, very complicated and detailed, but we find indeed, oh, hello, um, that uh, this does hold, this relationship does hold, and we can predict the motion of males and the way they solve these really complicated problems on the most simple premise that we can, which is just that they're attracted to females at distance, repelled from her at short distance, and also that the males mutually uh, repel one another. So this is telling us that even though the problem that they're facing, this task, seems incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult for us to even calculate which is the best option to take, these incredibly simple rules that males are using can solve this task, and that the spiders, even though they seem really limited in their sensory abilities, can in fact integrate a lot of information about the world and act on that um, and, and solve these problems. But there's one big element of this story that we haven't touched on yet, and that is the web itself. The web itself obviously contains a lot of information and is a lot of the world in which the spiders interact. So does the structure of the web itself have any influence on some of these processes, how these individuals move and interact with one another? And so to do this, we had to understand the structure of the web itself. And here we use a process called photogrammetry, which you might be familiar with, where we take a lot of photos of an object from many different angles, and we use, again, computational approaches to reconstruct that object. So we go from a real web, of which there is one just below us, there's another female, Nephila, uh, in, a, in, a, in a chamber, and she's built a web overnight. And we can take such a web and use these approaches to generate a digital model of that web in which we can explore all of the different paths, all of the different ways you could have moved, all of the different directions, changes, decisions you could have made on this three-dimensional structure and ask how are these spiders, in this case the males, moving on this web and are they using some kind of information in the web itself? If we look at that, we can then superimpose these tracks 
that we've, uh, for instance, taken and ask what is it about the web or indeed what is it about what's on the web that changes their path. And so here is some data from Sylvia, who I mentioned before, where we had real females on the web. There was a real spider. We also had a model female, which is a 3D printed plastic model of the female, which is just giving you a sort of weight, a target on the web that you might be moving towards. Or we had no female on the web. We in fact also had a vibrating female, um, but that's actually part of the installation downstairs. So I'd like you to go and experience such a thing yourself because you can also here today and tomorrow experience this seismic um, navigation problem because of one of the installations we've set up. The amazing thing here, or the really exciting thing really, is that the males don't care whether there's a female on the web or nothing at all on the web, they use the exact same paths to get to her. So they're moving towards a female even if she's not there. So that tells you there's something about the web that they're using to navigate. And so what is that thing? What we can do is overlay the tracks of the males on the webs and ask how they're using the web. And what we find is that they're being very, very clever. They walk along the exact edge of the capture web, the sticky part of the web, and they keep one leg on the emergency escape. So they're just walking along the edges and touching the support strands at every point in time. So if there's danger, oh, bang, they can drop and they're safe. If they were in the middle of the web, there's no option for them. There's no safety. There's no emergency escape. And so they are very, very sensitive to the silken structure of the web because the female, when she produces these webs, uses different types of silk. You may not know that, but there's different types of silk that they use to build the webs. And the males are being sensitive to the way those different types of silk transmit vibrations and avoiding death by doing so. Quite clever if you really think about it. Now let's look at the different ways that the female builds the web. So the first part of the web she builds is the support structure. It might not be too easy to see, I'm sorry, um, but there's a female here, she's sped up overnight building her web, and on the other side we have the, the tracks of the structure she produces. The support web is not sticky, um, and it has this sort of very scrambled appearance because this is basically the scaffolding. She builds this first, and then builds the web on top of it and then breaks these away once they've been used. Then she starts to build what we call the radial web. And I've always been very interested in whether this is a Fibonacci sequence of behavior. If you look at the way she lays them out, it's in a very interesting um, order that she does this. And this is more reminiscent of what you might expect of the spokes of a web. She moves to a place, anchors them, and pulls them tight. These are the parts of the web that do transmit vibrations. This is the navigational structure of the web. And indeed, it's the structure, again, you can experience downstairs. And then finally, she produces the orbital web. And this is, of course, the classic... Oh. oh, that's sad. Oh, well, technical difficulties. Oh, no, there it is. This is the classic spider web that I'm sure you're very used to seeing. I'm just going to check my time. Good. And this is the sticky part of the web, where if you touch these strands incorrectly, you're in big trouble. Now, of course, the male spiders have these clasping mechanisms that they don't get stuck so easily on this web, but they still can get stuck. And if the female pushes a big vibration into the web, which she often does, then the male can get dislodged, and then he's in serious, serious trouble. You might ask, why does the female eat the male? That's a foolish thing to do, isn't it? Well, actually, after the mating event, it's beneficial to both the male and the female that the male gets eaten. In fact, in many species, after mating with the female, the male does a backflip and smashes his body into her mouth, forcing her to eat him, because he will never mate again. He's, 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 it's not likely that he will find another mating partner without first being killed, so much better that I die, contribute nutrients to the eggs of this female that will be my offspring. So in fact, it sounds bad, but again, it's not a bad deal. Why would she eat him before that happens? Well, that's an interesting question evolutionarily. It's probably because she's not able to withhold that aggression. She just eats anything on the web, um, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes you eat one of your boyfriends, but you know, life goes on. 
Okay, so then, now let's look a bit more deeply at that web itself. And here I want to introduce you to something even more terrifying. My apologies. And this is the socially hunting spider, Stegodiphus dumicola. Uh, it's called a velvet spider because it's actually very cute. Fluffy, nice spiders. They live in these large colonies of potentially hundreds of individuals. And they do this swarming attack of anything that, that enters onto the web. And here we're really interested in this concept of how on earth would you navigate on a web to find something through seismic vibrations. You're listening on the web. Meanwhile, all of your friends are trampling around on the web making all of this noise. How on earth could this have evolved and be maintained and be an adaptive strategy? And so we're really interested in these kind of decisions of overlaying the tracks and seeing how they use the web um, and then understanding how they are avoiding this signal jamming and then also how they're coming to consensus decisions. So for instance, you see in this case, you had two different groups coming from different sides and then they've got to decide on which way they take the prey item back home. Now, in perhaps something that's not unexpected at all, if you know anything about many animals, including humans, they could not come to a consensus. They simply ripped the prey item in half and took half in each direction. I think there's a lesson in that. But here we're interested in understanding not only the interactions between individuals, but also how that interfaces with the web structure itself. And so we can, for instance, overlay these tracks of the individuals on the structure of the web and understand how they are using particular highways or different channels or organizing themselves um, and indeed updating the structure to be optimal for the tasks they're trying to solve. One thing I also want you to notice, if you can, is how they approach this item in this kind of stop-start fashion. Now, this is sped up, of course, because it's a bit slower than, than would be okay to present to you. Um, but this stop-start characteristic is, is very common in these socially hunting spiders. And I think maybe it's fairly obvious why, given this interference. But this is also something we're interested in. So here, for instance, we're looking again at these stegodiphus, and look at how they do this stuttered motion. They move, they stop, they listen, and then again they'll move. And so in this listening phase, they're trying to hear where this, in this case a grasshopper, is on the web. If they all moved randomly, then they wouldn't find that at all. Again, something you can experience in the installation. If you're the only one on the web and you're trying to find the vibrating item, it's not that hard. But if there are two of you on the web, or even three of you, you will really damage each other's chances unless you cooperate. But why would you cooperate if you all want the prey item? Why wouldn't you just do this scramble competition? Again, there's a lesson in that, I think, for all of us. Anyway, the last thing I want to leave you with, because I think I'm nicely on time, ah, and there's just some data, is a, a paper that came out from, from the lab just a few months ago um, about dreams and, and REM sleep in spiders. Um, and so we've been now working with these um, jumping spiders. And as I said to you, jumping spiders are a little bit different because they're so visual. And an amazing thing about these jumping spiders is that we can see the movement of the eyes when they're sleeping. And in this paper, again, we use these tracking approaches, and I'm, I'm happy to show you if you're interested up close. Um, but over here, in this image, we're tracking the location of the eyes, and what we find is that these jumping spiders have periods of REM sleep, or REM type sleep, where their eyes are flickering. They're flickering, and they're also performing these motions. I don't know if anyone has a dog or has even seen other people sleeping. Uh, yeah, sleeping. Um, you find that they go through these cycles where clearly they are dreaming. And here we have some of the first evidence that spiders also dream. Um, and, and this is a very visual spider, but we're extending that to the seismic world. And that's the thing I want to leave you with, this question. What would it be like to dream in pure seismic modality? What would it be like to not dream visually, but to feel things? And it's so far, the evidence that we have is that these orb-weaving spiders, like we have here, are also entering these REM dream-like phases. And so I think that's a really fun thing to, to think about um, in, in future as we go along. And with that, I would like to thank every 
body in the lab, all the students involved, all the students that are here, that are that they're currently involved, um, without whom, of course, none of this would uh, even have started and certainly not be finished. All of the funding bodies and all of my collaborators, both within the science world um, and the art world. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, please feel free to get in touch. And if you're interested in swimming or spiders, um, the, drop a line to me. And thanks to the spiders.